Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Your Creativity Podcast. I am your host, Dylan. I am a graphic designer from Salt Lake City, Utah, and I developed this blog, podcast, etc., to explore creativity with different artists, you know, podcasters, just finding how interesting people think and function and get their fun jobs done. Our first guest, this is the premiere episode, um, we've got Houston Huddleston. How are you today, Houston? I'm pretty darn well, I think. Oh, good to hear. A little background on Houston. He is the founder of the Sci-Fi, the Hollywood Sci-Fi Museum and the Hollywood Horror Museum. Um, Do you want to give us a little background on that, um, Houston? Sure. It began roughly four years ago when I found the... uh, Pardon me, I'm driving in the back of a car, so I start to sound like I'm talking like this. I'm not (laughs) trying to do it for effect. Um, I was sitting uh, at uh, an office in Hollywood, and below me was a uh, was the company that did the Star Trek tour from Paramount. And lo and behold, uh, they were getting rid of their uh, Star Trek sets. And it, one of them, the Star Trek Next Generation bridge, had been sitting outside for five years, and I rescued it, and the original series bridge. And... Uh, I got all these people from Star Trek together to be on our board of directors, Ronald D. Moore and Andrew Probert and Rick Sternbach and a whole bunch of people. And they helped me get to the next step, but then we realized there was no place to put the, the thing once we finished it. And I couldn't derive any money specifically for the bridge set because CBS owned the rights, so we can only do so much as a nonprofit. And so we created the Hollywood Science Fiction Museum. And from there, uh, we kept getting offered props from horror films. And more importantly, the studios were not as interested in sci-fi, a lot of them, as they were horror because of all the different horror TV shows. There's six sci-fi shows on TV, and there are over 20 horror ones, including Emmy-winning uh, American Horror Story and Walking Dead and iZombie and the Hannah on the list. So uh, that museum has only been around seven months uh, in development, and that one's just skyrocketed. I mean, we have pretty much every famous horror director, producer, writer involved with that. I mean, I, I tell people the only ones we don't have are pretty much Stephen King and uh, uh, Anne Rice, but everybody else, Clyde Barker, Joe Dante, uh, John Carpenter, everybody is involved with that thing. So <laughs> this is just this is the age of the nerd, basically. Why are movie companies so quick to throw away these props that they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on? It seems like with the amount of money that they've invested into it and the popularity of museums that they would open up these museums themselves. Well, they don't care, number one. Uh, They're about the upcoming thing, not the thing that just flopped or made some money, and then they care about the DVD Blu-ray release, and then, um, you know, that will sit on it and think about, okay, what's next for my job to get a promotion? Uh, the reason sets don't stick around is, number one, they're very fragile, most of them. Number two, they're very big and heavy, and they don't want to store it, especially for something that's a one-shot deal. The movie Oblivion was a Tom Cruise film and cost a bit under $100 million, I think, but they made all practical props. The spaceship was a full-size spaceship, not a CG thing. And so they weren't going to do a sequel to it because it was never intended to. It did okay, box office-wise. And then I got a call from Universal saying, hey, you guys want this? Absolutely. Uh, it cost $8 million to make. And, you know, it's give it to us or destroy it. Um, and it's too big for someone to put in their living room. Uh, and it happens all the time it's just it's about the money to store it and it's about the protection that it won't be used for some little crappy TV show or movie 
uh, after it was made for some multi-million dollar project uh, starring Tom Cruise or whatever, you know? As a viewer, you know, you think about, you know, sitting in those ships or, you know, how it feels behind those controls. So getting them in a museum is great because you, you can feel that instead of it just being tossed out. Well, you know, also the thing to remember, these things typically are not made to stay forever. They are made for the life of the shoot and then, you know, either turned into something else, like Star Trek did that all the time. Uh, there was something they uh, you're still, you know, you watch uh, Mork, Mork and Mindy, you're seeing all of Mork's friends show up and all of these used Star Trek outfits with the insignia taken off. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's whatever will keep the budget down. They, they certainly, absolutely didn't care about the integrity of, oh my God, these are going to be priceless things someday. <laughs> uh, with the Horror Museum, uh, it's hard to find anything before 1980 that was a prop, because uh, it was destroyed. It was treated like garbage. If you go to newstarship.com, you can see some of the photos of you actually taking these props out of the studio facilities. Was that an overwhelming task? Absolutely. It wasn't just the doing it of it, because God knows I can't lift. No, it's chair. forklifts and all that kind of jazz, right? Well, yeah, it, it took two whole moving vans, or it took one. There's two whole moving vans. I can't remember one moving van twice, something like that. It was massive, though. And it, I do remember it took two days, and it took these three heavy, you know, like circus guys <laughs> to <laughs> lift everything. Um, and once we put the D bridge back in commission and get it all together again, it's absolutely going to take a forklift and a crane probably. And, uh, a lot of big boy tools <laughs> to, uh, put it together. Cause it's, it weighs several tons. This thing is not some little light thing. And then the emotional stress and the, trying to figure out what to do with it after and keeping it in my backyard and putting the tarp over it initially for the first six months or so. But that was very stressful because uh, the neighbors were complaining. <laughs> they weren't Trekkies. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it, it was... Uh, the whole thing was a really crazy, stupid thing to do. But I'm just glad that I uh, had learned from other failed things, what to do and how to do it, and just a lot of it was leave of faith. How about the regi uh, the resuscitation process? That seems overwhelming, too. Oh, I, I couldn't have picked a, a worse prop to, <laughs> to try to restore. Uh, uh, the Enterprise Bridge, the D, from Next Generation, is the most complex set probably in the world. I, I don't know of anyone that... Probably another set that would be as complex would be the interior of Millennium Falcon or uh, one of the other bridge sets, like from Battlestar Galactica. But this one, not only is it heavy as hell, made of fiberglass and metal, but it's uh, got each one of those back computers needs a separate computer uh, to show the graphics. You need a master computer to control all those other computers. You need a lighting system, a sound system. Uh, a controller for all of those things, uh, not to mention video projector, and uh, it has to, you have to create the, the content for it. Uh, and my God, it's just another thing and another thing and another thing. But uh, a little a bit later this year, we'll have the money to finally do it all, and we'll do it right and get the original people who made it to do it. Uh, Herman Zimmerman and uh, hopefully Michael Kuda, definitely uh, Doug Drexler and all the people who worked on the show. Since, since we are talking about updates, what, what, can you give us a, you know, kind of a big picture update of both the, the sci-fi and the horror? Well, we uh, just finished the, uh, the outlay of the land, so to speak, of what we can fit in the space given to us, which is about 40,000 square feet. Uh, it, we've intended to do this in Los Angeles, and quite frankly, the powers that be really aren't as enthusiastic as they need to be to get this going because it's a lot of money. 
and I went to other cities, and so far the top four runner seems to be Vegas. So when you've got a hotel that's willing to give you pretty much everything you need to open for six months or three months, and then you've got in another city, oh, you know, we'll put you in a in the middle of nowhere that nobody's ever heard of, with gangland all around you, and maybe the mayor will show up. You know, really? So uh, yeah. we have to go where the money is, where we can open this thing right and not just be a, a crappy little, you know, museum with here's some stuff. That's not, that was never our intention. Um, that will be end of this year. Is looking like the opening for the Sci-Fi Museum. And then after the six months, it will tour around the U.S. and probably world. We've already gotten some offers from Japan and Dubai and uh, what was the other? China and Korea and... Yeah, so that's for that. And then for the Horror Museum, it's uh, going to be next year, yeah, probably also in Vegas. Uh, Vegas seems to be the, the thumb on the pulse of what's cool and exciting and extravagant. <laughs> <laughs> Logistically, is it difficult to ship something that big from Las Vegas to Beijing? Uh, yes, uh, but you... You'd use many containers, metal containers, and we probably won't ship the entire bridge. We'll probably just bring the chairs and, you know, the, uh, the, 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 that side of it, because there's a lot of wasted space yeah. on that D bridge, to be blatantly honest. But that said, when you're on it, it's the most awesome thing in the world, from uh, my being on, on it in Vegas and Ron Moore and the guys who were on the actual filming set, the set, you know, it's Actually, it fools your brain into thinking you're really on a starship. Uh, same with the original series, the Captain Kirk one. But yeah, it's a lot of effort, but I've got people, the company I'm dealing with called SEE Touring is the same one that did the tour in the late 90s uh, and early 2000s, so they know what they're doing, and I implicitly trust them. Uh, I don't trust me. I, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> How humbling was it to get nearly a hundred thousand dollars from the public on your Kickstarter campaign? Well, it was uh, wonderful, and it wouldn't have happened had it not been for uh, Uncle George. You know, Sulu uh, was instrumental. Instrumental? Well, what's the word? Uh, instrumental. In instrumental. Uh, I'm not tired. Instrumental. <laughs> uh, in, instrumental. It was instrumental. Uh, instrumental to do that. He posted it on his Facebook and Twitter to, you know, 9 million followers. And in three days, we raised 50,000, and then we got the rest through just uh, word of mouth. Um, and it had to happen that way, because I, that, that's not arrogance. It's just, if we're going to do, this is a multi, multi-million dollar project we're doing, and had it not been for that initial uh, 93,000, we couldn't have done it. And it's just, uh, just to give you an example of what things cost, uh, and the reason we'll probably go to Vegas instead of L.A., if we rented a warehouse in L.A., a warehouse, mind you, not a nice prime middle of uh, Hollywood location, 40,000 square feet costs you about $40,000 a month. And that's just for the rental wow. of the bloody building. Uh, not to mention the props, the insurance, the shipping, the cost of electricity, the people who are going to work it, that every, everything else, all the expendables, uh, not to mention our gift shop, not to mention the cafe that's going to be there, not to mention, oh, God, it just goes on and on. So without that kind of help uh, for a nonprofit, you're screwed. So Yeah, you need, you need that help, and it was good that George was able to come in and do that. Um, and other companies have too. Microsoft, Google, yeah, uh, Lockheed Martin, uh, NASA's helps. You know, it, it needs that because you're dealing with not just the oh, isn't this cool factor, but the educational factor, which is teaching space and science and tying it in with science fiction. Uh, props to CBS too, because they could have you know, they could have you know shut you down on everything at you know at their, those early days, right? Well, no, no, no. They really didn't. Um, they. Uh, but I potentially, they could have. Me. Well, I, I was petrified they were going to sue me. 
I got this bridge, not illegally, but I still I had this bridge that presumably had been thrown out or was going to be dumped, and they thought it had been dumped. Everybody thought it didn't exist anymore because it fell through the cracks when CBS and Paramount parted ways. Uh, people got fired, and then the holder of the keys don't know, you know, the person who replaces them doesn't know everything. So that's how I got those two bridge sets. And uh, I flat out told them, you know, I said, look, I, I want to do this right. We're a nonprofit. I got all these people that used to work for you guys who want this to happen. And they said, okay, here's what you do. Uh, put a disclaimer that you were not affiliated with CBS or, or Paramount. And, I, and you know, everything they asked us to do, we did. Uh, they were never quote unquote dicks about it. They were very businesslike. They asked us not to uh, interfere. They, they asked basically not to do something that was going to uh, exploit their property or, or to make it a Star Trek museum. So I said, let's make it a science fiction museum with everything. Would you guys have a problem with that? And they said, no. So that was pretty much it. Uh, we basically just stayed out of each other's... You know, I, I don't know how other to describe that. I've, I've kept them up to date with stuff, uh, whether they wanted to know or not. And for the 50th, for our first big opening, I'm really hoping we can uh, do a limited partnership for that they will give their seal of approval. Uh, and magical kiss of, of life. <laughs> uh, we have the right to do it without them, but I much prefer to do it with them. I mean, who wouldn't? Now, now aside from the, these uh, museums, let's let's talk about you for a couple minutes. Um, ah, that's boring. <laughs> <laughs> your, your projects are fun. I've I've heard some things you, you do. T- tell us about what you know what you do when you're not dealing with the museums. I cry a lot. <laughs> I, uh, I uh, well, I'm a writer. I mean, that's my main God-given gift, talent, and I'm trying to get some projects going. And one of them, hopefully, will be uh, Trek-related, uh, official Trek, because I wrote a non-official Trek thing for uh, Star Trek Continues called Olani, and uh, I. Uh, I mean, I'm in that bumpy car again, so I'm just I'm like I'm nervous, but I'm really not. Yeah, I primarily it's writing, but also uh, trying to get some productions for both the sci-fi and the horror museum because our teams of boards of directors and the people involved are brilliant, brilliant people and so talented. And specifically with the horror one, they're so creative as far as writing and directing. I would love to have some projects that are produced by the museums uh, that would be not just documentary, but also uh, maybe an, an anthology series like Mick Garris did with uh, Masters of Horror. And, uh, you know, just there are various things that can be done that would be so cool. Um, and we're all trying. We're uh, one of our newest board members, uh, Rebecca uh, McKendry, Who's with uh, was previously with Fangoria uh, Magazine. She still is, but mostly she's with uh, Bloomhouse. And Bloomhouse produces Paranormal Activity and Oculus and uh, oh god, just pretty much anything Universal Horror related. And I'm trying to get in with them. You know, uh, I'm I'm no fool. <laughs> <laughs> Stick to, close to talent. That that's you know that's what I've learned. You know, through my voyages through you know my design always, and you will always try to surround yourself with people much more brilliant than you are or much more powerful or much more talented or much more whatever or known or whatever uh, and you know God knows I try to do that because uh, I have knowledge but I don't have any money and I don't have any uh, fame outside of certain geek circles well you're your tops in my book um <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that, that must be a very small book. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's my wife Sasha and you, <laughs> but you're in there. Is, well, thank you. Is, is there anything you want to, you know, promote or? The whole goal of both museums is to appeal to everyone. Uh, a very small-minded guy once told me when I was trying to say that the Sci-Fi Museum would promote, uh, would teach science and in space 
can tie it in with science fiction as well as teach filmmaking and teach costuming and makeup and prosthetics. And I was giving the laundry list of all the things that it can do and would do, maybe not comprehensive, one, you know, 501 or 103 courses, but at least get people interested of all ages and have various, uh, you know, demographics of the ages and age groups and kindergarten through, you know, high school and then beyond and all this stuff. And I was giving him this stuff, and he said, well, you can't be all things to all people or something to that effect. You can't appeal to everybody. And I said, why the hell not? You don't have to, it doesn't take that much more effort to appeal to everyone, even just a little bit. Yeah. than it does to make a boring museum that only appeals to one type of person. Because that bores me. I don't mind telling you. I'm not a scientist. Uh, I'm not a, uh, a nuclear physicist. I'm not a space. You know, I, I'm a fan, but I can't do it worth a damn. I, it's the <laughs> furthest thing from my mind. And when I go into those museums and they don't appeal to my mindset and mentality and grade level, uh, I... I I go elsewhere. My mind goes elsewhere, and I become bored. And that's not what I want with either of these museums. I want uh, sci-fi people to love the horror ones, and I want the horror ones to appreciate the sci-fi ones. Uh, and you do it in ways that, okay, you don't like this? How about this? Oh, you don't like that? How about this? Oh, what about this? And, and why the hell not do it, you know? So uh, go to our websites and check them out, and if you don't like that one, here's another one. <laughs> uh they're um, hollywoodsci-fi.com or .org, and then there's hollywoodhorror.org. And they both have videos that explain who's involved and what we're doing. And um, I, I, I've yet to receive really any negative hate mail, uh, which is a good thing. <laughs> That's a great thing, you know, because if I was in your position and I would get things like that, I it takes to you know, a stronger person to, you know, kind of hold up to, you know, some of the stuff that people say. Oh, God knows I've gotten hate. Oh, I, <laughs> absolutely. I've gotten bitter, spiteful, hateful, angry, nasty, despicable comments about my character and about, you know, just horrible stuff said to me. But uh, that was a while back. And the thing is, when somebody pulls that kind of garbage on me, I just say, Really, why don't you tell that Greg Nicotero is right over there, uh, who's the producer, director of Walking Dead, you know? And people who are that nasty minded, they don't typically have the balls to say that to people like that because those people are involved with our project. And if they're bad mouthing me or the project, they're bad mouthing all those people. And, uh, you know, that it's like hiding behind a computer saying spiteful, nasty things. I don't get that. I don't do that. I've never gotten that. I, uh, I face people straight out. I try, if someone says something nasty, I say, "Okay, why? Why do you feel that way?" Well, you know, what's well, well, and they typically don't respond, or they respond and they're. Uh, I I end up making a if not, you know, friend, then at least not an enemy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, you have to be thick skinned um, to do this because you're dealing with so many different types of people. Um, and people think it's misinterpreted and all that jazz. But I, I just, I hope people, this whole thing's about love. I mean, it really is. Uh, everybody involved is doing this because they want to do this. No one's being paid. It's a beautiful thing you're doing, especially bringing the children into the an environment where not only can they see neat creations, but they can actually learn. And I don't think there's enough of that going on in this culture. So thank you for doing that. Uh, well, of course. You can do it at, com at comic conventions, same thing. You know, there are always bits and pieces. If people get into that culture, they can be inspired, even if it's just ins inspiration. It doesn't have to be flat-out course of something, you know? Uh, someone could be introverted and then dress up as whatever, and they'll get over it. You know, they'll be confident. They'll, it'll open up new sides of, of them, and I think that could change people in a very positive way. Well, thank you, Houston, for joining us in my first episode of Your Creativity. When you know things get uh, closer to happening at the end of the year, we'll we'll check back in with you. Well, well thanks Dylan for... definitely will know. I'll be bugging him immensely when when these things happen. <laughs> <laughs> 
whether he'll want it or not. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for joining us. No, thank you.